chapter 16 addresses the, the question of variable capital on a social level. And so workers play an important role in the circulation of capital by the way that they buy commodities. And yet uh, capitalists have an interest in keeping workers poor um, and therefore um, keeping the price of labor as low as possible in the production process. And yet this creates this contradiction when workers are poor, they're limited in their capacity to buy commodities. And so I'm curious about this um, seeming irrationality within the capitalist system or this contradiction um, and how it plays out in the creation of effective demand and how you see that as part of the potential for ongoing crisis formation. This is one of the big contrasts between volume one of Capital and volume two. And this is one of the, the I think, one of the big insights that comes out from looking at volume two. In volume one, what we see towards the end is a theory of accumulation in which the poor get poorer and poorer and poorer as a result of the kind of processes, the utopian processes of uh, the free market. But in volume two of Capital, when you start to look at all of the circulation processes, you realize that the workers have a very important role in consuming the product. Mm -hmm. And throughout volume two, this theme of the role of workers as consumers uh, comes more and more into the picture. And, and while it is true that the, the workers can't provide all of the effective demand in an economy, they provide a very substantial part of it. And if you diminish that part, then somebody else has to take over and, and, and provide the extra demand to mop up the product. So yeah, this, this becomes a theme. And, and it's interesting how it works out in volume two. It's sort of touched upon very briefly in the first few chapters. And then it comes up in the chapter on variable capital. And then when you get towards the end, it becomes a very significant theme. By the time you get to end of volume two, Marx is talking about certain concerns there are in the capitalist class that the workers aren't going to spend their money on the right kinds of things, i.e. the products which the capitalists are making. And uh, so there comes in, if you like, rational workers' consumption comes in at the end of volume two. And I think one of the best examples of that was that when Henry Ford set up this five dollar eight hour day, you know, back in 1917 or 18 or whenever it was, he sent us a whole army of social workers into the workers' homes to teach them to consume properly. He didn't want them spending their money on, you know, drink and women and all this kind of stuff. He <laughs> wanted rational consumption from the standpoint of, 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 of capital. So, this is something which, 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 when you're reading volume one, you would never dream of as being an issue. But by the time you get to the end of volume two, it has become a very significant issue. Of course, what that says to me is that there's a massive potential for contradiction here. And the way I would generally put it is that if capital is working well along the lines of volume one, you're going to be out of balance in volume two. If you're working well in the volume two sense, you're going to have to be out of balance in the volume one sense. So there's a contradiction between the two, two volumes. So uh, how do you like these chapters this week? Were they, were they fun? Did, did you understand what was going on? I had a very hard time of it, I must say. I, I went over them several times trying to figure out. I think there are a couple of things going on here that, that uh, the background. One is, uh, of course, Marx's uh, perpetual argument with uh, the political economists of the time. And as we've seen several times, he gets very much involved in sort of the counterflow of his criticism of them and what he feels may be their criticism of him. So it's a sort of dialogue of that kind, and it's sometimes, you know, tempting to get a little impatient with him for spending his time on those kinds of, you said this and I said that kind of stuff. And, and you wish he would get on to sort of really talk about you know, how this actually impacts his whole uh, theoretical structure. But before we get too critical of him, I have to say that in contemporary academia, if you took away all of the articles which were about dissing somebody else or protecting yourself about being dissed by somebody else, you probably would be left with only about 10% of the articles. So I think uh, the manner of debate and discussion, the only difference this time is here is that 
we're not necessarily familiar with uh, the terrain on which he's working. I mean, we haven't read Torrens, we haven't read all the Ricardian school, so we wouldn't be familiar with uh, what it is. And, uh, you know, it's sort of entering into a bit of a middle of an argument and not knowing who the opponents are and what the issues are. And I'll try and point out, I think, one very significant uh, aspect of that. The other problem is uh, uh, this wonderful little kind of comment that uh, uh, Engels makes on page uh, 359. The preparation of this chapter for publication has involved no small difficulties. Despite Marx's firm grasp of algebra, he was never at ease in reckoning with figures, i.e. in commercial calculations, even though there is a thick sheaf of notebooks in which he worked through all the various kinds of commercial calculation in several examples. But knowledge of the proper rules of calculation is not all the same thing as exercised in the everyday practical calculations of the trader, and in his turnover calculations, Marx became confused, with the result that apart from being incomplete, they contained many errors and contradictions. In the tra tables reproduced above, I have retained only the simplest and arithmetically correct calculations, mainly for the following reason. So he spared us actually you know, republishing all of those, that big sheaf of notebooks with <laughs> erroneous calculations. But you often find actually Marx, when he adds things up, doesn't add them up right. Um, so Engels goes on to say, the uncertain results of this tiresome calculation business, and I have to say I got understood what he meant by that, led Marx to ascribe an undeserved significance to what in my opinion is in fact a matter of little importance. That's the other problem, uh, particularly in, in the first of these chapters. But there are some issues that are raised here that I think are, are important, and I, I try to identify what I think they are, and, and maybe you have some different uh, uh, opinions. So let's look at uh, chapter 15, which is about the effect of circulation time on the magnitude of the capital advanced. Um, and we can go through this, I think, in a series of, of steps. Uh, there is a distinction here immediately set up between a working period and a circulation period. Uh, production time, where there's no work going on but it's still in production, is left out of the picture here, and he assumes that working period and production time are coterminous. There are times when he talks about what happens when production time is not the same as work, working period, but the main distinction here is between working period when people are actually working on making something and are actually sort of uh, uh, creating value in the labor process and, and the circulation time when it's going off on the market. So he kind of uses this example on the first page on uh, 334. He's saying, well, let, let, suppose there's a working period where there's nine weeks uh, labor and then let the circulation time be three weeks. The total turnover period is then 12 weeks. After nine weeks have elapsed, elapsed, the productive capital advanced is transformed into commodity capital, but it now has to spend three weeks in the circulation period. Thus, the new cycle of production can begin again only at the start of the 13th week, and production is at a standstill for three weeks, or a quarter of the total circulation period. Now, one of the theses that then comes uh, very important here is uh, the idea of the continuity of, uh, of, of capital. And if you go to 356, Marx says, continuity is itself a productive force of labor. It's a very important kind of statement at the, at the, towards the bottom there. And this continuity, therefore, has to be maintained at all costs. Any break in the continuity, and that has been an argument right from the very beginning of Volume 2, that any break in the continuity is, is a loss of capital, and that therefore you cannot afford it, so the continuity is significant. But what you've immediately got here uh, in uh, this first part of uh, Chapter 15 is this idea that there is going to be a loss because there are three weeks where you can't produce, because you've got to wait for your money to come back. Now, there are two solutions to this, he says. One is that you don't actually invest uh, the whole of the 900 pounds uh, in, in the production process. You sort of hold some of it back so that you have enough to carry the three over the three weeks. He doesn't like that solution too much. He raises some objections to it. 
uh, that there may be difficulties of meeting certain scale requirements in production and all the rest of it. Um, frankly, I don't see why that is so radically different from the second solution, which he gets to on uh, page uh, 336. If, however, we assume the reverse of this, this, namely that the nature of the investment excludes a reduction in the scale of production, and hence also in the fluid capital to be advanced each week, then the continuity of production can be maintained only by an additional fluid capital, in the above case one of 300 pounds. So what we've got is a situation where the working period, we're sort of in this working period, so we're progressing, and, and we've got a, at the end of nine weeks, that's over, and then we've got the circulation time, and we have 900 at the beginning, we have 900 pounds at the beginning, uh, and we invest it, and in, he then sort of also in this excludes any investment in uh, constant capital and says, that imagine a situation where we're just dealing with variable capital turning over and for, forget the constant capital, and he also excludes any question of fixed capital at the moment. So the fixed capital is excluded, the constant capital is excluded. We're just going to look at the 900 pounds, which is going to variable capital. So 900 pounds is going, going to the laborers as they produce uh, over, this, over this kind of period, over in this period. Then you get here and you need another 300 pounds. So you have to invest, find another 300 pounds at this point to cover over this period. Then what happens is you finally get your money back here, which is you get your 900 pounds, you get it back here, but you only need it 600, you only need another 600 to complete the, the next working period. So what this does is it actually means that you've got an idle money capital now of 300 pounds, because you've got 300 here and then you've got 600 here which takes up your, makes you 900, but you've, you've got the 300 pound surplus. So we've got a surplus of money capital uh, in here, which is now staying idle uh, for, uh, so that, that surplus is, is 300 pounds, is going to stay surplus until you get into the next period where you need another 900 pounds and so it goes on. So this is how, how Marx is in imagining the situation. So this is how this works. So again, back on 336, during the three weeks for which the capital exists in the circulation sphere, functioning as commodity capital, it is the same for the production process as if it did not exist at all. We are abstracting here from all credit relations, and this is the kind of credit thing keeps on coming back in and out of this chapter in the usual annoying kind of, kind of way. And assume, therefore, that the capitalist operates only with his own capital. But while the capital advance for the first working period spends three weeks in the circulation process after completing its production process, an additional capital outlay of 300 pounds now functions so that the continuity of production is not interrupted. So again, this notion of the, 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 there must not be any interruption of, of, of continuity. Now, this argument then is, I think, uh, a very um, important one, this notion of continuity and how the continuity is going to main, be maintained. Moving in this, in this direction, uh, we find him immediately confronting uh, the economists, so that on page 342, the economists, who have never produced a clear account of the turnover mechanism, constantly overlook this basic aspect i.e. the fact that only a part of the industrial capital can be actually engaged in the production process, if production is to proceed without interruption. In other words, one part can function as productive capital only on condition that another part is withdrawn from production proper in the form of commodity or money capital. Since this is overlooked, so also is the importance and role of money capital in general. Now, you'll detect immediately then a certain shift in, in Marx's argument here, from the beginning of volume two, where money capital, it's almost a fetish, you know, to imagine that that is what capital's really all about. But here he's kind of coming back to saying, well, actually the money capital now looks different uh, because it's through having surplus money capital available that you can actually assure the continuity of 
the, the production process. Um, what this then leads him to is, um, and I have to jump all over the place, is that in this continuity there is what he calls a setting free of a certain amount of capital, i.e. this capital is set free. It, it has to be there in relationship to the production process, but it is, it is, it is not engaged in the production process. And this is the, one of the main themes, uh, and again go back to 356, sorry to jump around but I think you have to do this. He says, if we now look more closely at the capital that is set free, or in actual fact suspended, it is clear that a significant part of this must always possess the form of money capital. And then on 357, this money capital, towards the bottom of 357, that is set free simply by the mechanism of the turnover movement, together with the money capital set free by the successive reflux of the fixed capital, and that needed for variable capital in every lab labour process, must play a significant role as soon as the credit system has developed and must also form one of the foundations for this. Now I think this is an extremely, extremely important statement. Extremely important. Uh, because what Marx is, is saying here is not only that the credit has a significant role, but that actually this credit system becomes necessary. That, that this is, if you like, by looking at the turnover time, and we've seen this before in fixed capital, right? And he mentions fixed capital here also. That because of the differential turnover times and the need for continuity, and because of the complexities that arrive of fixed capital, particularly of long, of long standing, you need the credit system. If, you didn't, if a credit system did not exist, then it would have to be created. Now Marx's argument in Volume 3 on the credit system, as you remember, is the credit system existed in various forms, usury and all the rest of it existed, but then it got disciplined to capital's purpose. But now you're seeing it from the other end, you're seeing what the disciplinary apparatus is about, what, what, what has to be done to the credit system, or how the credit system has to evolve in, in order to meet these demands which are arising out of uh, the, the purely objective conditions of differential turnover times and, which, and, 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 fix, and the circulation of, of fixed capital in particular. So I, it, it struck me that when he says that, that all of this must also form one of the foundations for the credit system, that this is, if you like, him kind of saying, well, you know. Now, obviously this means that his exclusion, you remember, go back to the Grundrisse, I mean his argument there was, well, interest is a particularity and therefore is outside of uh, the generality. But he says about consumption, and actually if you go back and read those passages very carefully, he'll always have the, the caveat, except insofar as they enter back into production and are determinate inside of production. And what it seems to me you've got here is a kind of link passage, which kind of says the credit system is going to be determinate inside of the general laws of motion of capital, and it has to be because of this foundational connect connection. So, in a way, what Marx is doing is not necessarily abandoning the argument that's in there in the Grundrisse, but recognizing that there is a way in which the credit system gets internalized within the laws of motion of capital, and, and this is why. So what, in a way, Volume 2 does, in, in general I think, is to start to establish why it is that you cannot analyze the general laws of motion of capital without actually entering into uh, some detailed discussion of how the nature of the credit system is working. And as you will recall from the Volume 3 stuff we read, when Marx talked about the functions of the credit system, the first two functions were it, it, it deals with turnover time and it deals with fixed capital. Okay? And, and he doesn't then sort of take it much further, but you can uh, those, those particular issues much further. But this is, so, so this is uh, where, I, where, I, where I think there's a certain connection uh, between volumes one and, and uh, between volume two and three. This then leads him a little bit further on, and, and this is where, where Engels comes, comes into the picture again. 
because Marx, in talking about this particular setting free, uh, Engels kind of says his examples, and this is this the uncertain results of the tiresome calculation about of the setting free, these examples have an undeserved significance in, 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 to what, in my opinion, is in fact a matter of little importance, says Engels, but this does not actually deny the significance of the general no notion of setting free. In other words, Marx's example uh, is um, problematic for a number of, number of reasons, which we'll, we'll, we'll get to in, in a minute. Um, but if you go to the end of, of what Engels says here, on 360, he says, the main thing in the text is the proof that a considerable part of industrial capital is always present in the money form, while a still more considerable part must assume this form from time to time. This proof is reinforced, if anything, by these additional remarks of mine. So Engels is not saying the general point is wrong, in fact he's saying Marx is dead right about the general point, but his examples are not very, you know, not, not very significant ones. And I think we can see that a little bit when we go back and start to look at the actual way in which Marx sets this up. This is where the tedious stuff gets in. As this um, process con continues, uh, and the continuity uses this 300 pounds to assure the continuity. Uh, he then runs through a whole series of, of, of examples, uh, and, you know, without, without getting too deeply into them, but he ends up with these three typical marks, he kind of says, alright, I'm going to look at this situation where working period and circulation period are equal, and does a bunch of calculations. And then he says, okay, working period longer than circulation period, and then, you know, you saw this tactic, tactic in volume one, by the way, this kind of, well, and then the third example is uh, working period shorter than circulation period, and we get all these uh, so, sorts of things. Now, the result is, I think, kind of interesting. The above investigation, he says, on 355, is that the various portions in which the capital has to be divided, so that one part of it can always be in its working period while other parts are in their circulation period, uh, relieve each other like independent private capitals in two cases. If the working period is equal to the circulation period, and the turnover period is thus divided into two equal sections, then there is no capital which has to be free. I mean, it, furthermore, if the circulation period is longer than the working period, but is a simple multiple of it, so that one circulation period equals n working periods, where n must be, the whole num be a whole number, in these cases no part of capital successively advanced is set free. So there are two cases which are, you know, pretty accidental, in which you don't get any capital being set free, you don't need to set it free. But his general conclusion uh, is at the bottom of um, 355, that in all the other instances, a very significant portion of the social circulating capital, which is turned over several times in the year, will thus periodically exist in the course of the annual turnover cycle in the form of capital set free. Now this is the point where Engels didn't uh, uh, really like the argument uh, too, too much. Um, but then this question is, well, why not start talking about the credit system? Which he did in 357 in that passage I earlier read. Uh, so that credit obviously is going to come in here. I mean, why do, you, why do you need to just hang around with your 300 pounds in your pocket? Why don't you put it on the money market while it's out there and then bring it back in when you need it? You know, why, why, you know, why not do that? Uh, but Marx recognizes that that can happen. Uh, and recognizes uh, when, when you get into this that this could, of, of course, this setting free could actually then affect the money market, which he then starts to talk about at the bottom of 357. He says uh, 600 pounds exists on the money market for one week and 300 pounds for four weeks instead of three. So since this does not affect, he says, one single capitalist, remember the money market is the common capital of the class, so uh, the, the, there are therefore uh, situations in which there will be fluctuating flows into the money market depending upon who 
uh, needs what when, and who has surpluses what when. And he then starts to talk about that on 358, uh, and, um, and then he starts talking about the fact that uh, capitalists can borrow money, so on 358 towards the top there, capitalists who operate with borrowed capital will exert less demand on the money market, which relieves it as much as does increased supply. Alternatively, the sums that have become superfluous for the turnover mechanism will eventually be def definitively thrown out onto the money market. But then comes something else interesting. He talks about, well, what happens when there's a contraction of the circulation time? As a result, he says, of this contraction, from, say, three to two weeks, and hence of the turnover period from nine weeks to eight, one-ninth of the total capital advance becomes superfluous. The six-week working period could now be kept going just as steadily with 800 pounds as it could before with 900 pounds, an obvious point. But then, a little further on, we can see from this how a surfeit of money capital can arise. And not only in the sense that the supply of money capital is greater than the demand for it, the latter is never more than a relative surplus, which is found, for instance, in the depressed period that opens the new business cycle after the crisis is over. Because you remember in Volume 3 you get these things of uh, you know, a business cycle and surpluses of money capital. But in this instance, he says, it is rather in the sense that a definite part of the capital advanced is superfluous, superfluous for the overall process of social reproduction, which includes the circulation process, and is therefore precipitated out in the form of money capital. It is thus a surplus which has arisen with the scale of production and prices remaining the same, simply by a contraction in the turnover period. The mass of money in circulation, whether this is larger or smaller, does not have the slightest influence on this. So, the surplus of money capital which is available is going to be influenced by these shifts in, in circulation time. But conversely, he says, if the circulation period is extended, say from three weeks to five, then of course this puts pressure on the money market. And 359 he says, this additional capital can be obtained only from the money market. If the prolongation of the circulation period affects one or more major lines of business, then it may exert pressure on the money market, if this effect is not cancelled out by a counter-effect from another direction. In this case, too, it is manifestly evident that this pressure, just like the surplus in the previous case, has nothing to do with a change either in the prices of commodities or in the quantity of the available means of circulation. So what we're looking at here is an ebb and flow, but the ebb and flow is obviously very sensitive to the circulation time, and that becomes absolutely critical. Now, we're going to come across this again, what is one of the big ways in which circulation time gets reduced? What did we talk about last time? Hmm? Means of transportation. Means of transportation. Uh, I mean, okay, the Suez Canal opens, and you remember that from Volume Three. The Suez Canal opens, and so you know, the whole kind of business of, of trading with India, instead of taking, uh, I don't know, three months, uh, takes uh, six weeks. And this, uh, this has a huge, there's a huge reduction in circulation time, which then actually means that less money has to be wrapped up in the production process, because the circulation time is contracted. Now, I don't know if you remember when the, the British and the French decided to try and reoccupy the canal zone and the Suez Canal got blocked. Okay, what did that do to circulation times? And what did that do actually to pressures on the money market? Because you needed new, more money to, to carry the fact that you still now had to go around the Cape of Good Hope instead of going through the Suez Canal. So you can think of something as simple as the Suez Canal and, and imagine you know, what would happen to global capital if you, if you block, simultaneously blocked the Suez Canal and the Panama Canal? I'm not s saying you should, you know, in case <laughs> any, anybody... But the point, the, point, the point here is that there are... Th th that you can see dramatic shifts in circulation times. And we're, we're, this is going to become also very important in, 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 in the next section uh, as well. But, so this, this, this question, of, of circulation times uh, in relationship to uh, production, uh, to, to, to working time, starts to, to enter into the picture, and it's going to enter into the picture in a big way. 
Now, these are about the only points, uh, major points I would take out of this chapter. I mean, it's the longest chapter, but I mean, do you, any of you have any kind of ideas that come out of this chapter that, that uh, are different or go beyond it? Yeah. It seems to me that Engels critical comment um, on the setting free misses a certain point in Marx's argument. For Marx it seems to be important to make a connection to the predicate thing which he's not dealing with. <coughs> and Engels just says, well, this has little importance. It seems that he he misses a point that Marx is interested in. Interested in or well, I don't think so. At the end of Engels' comment, he says Marx is right, you know. Uh, about the general kind of question, uh, but his particular example is, you know, and, and the way he worked it out is not, you know, is not robust enough to really carry the weight of what, of what, of how important this really is. You're right. Engels is not connecting it to the credit system. Well, he Engels is dismissing the whole thing with a uh, with a setting free. Even if he concedes at the end there is something, but the, the whole thing with the setting free is of little importance. And for Marx's development of the argument, it has some importance. And well, well no, I, well, I, I don't read Engels' that, uh, comment that way. I read it as saying, kind of saying, well, you know, Marx, by working through these arithmetical things in this kind of way, actually trivialized what is a much bigger argument. That's what I, that's what I've seen him saying. And actually, we'll, we'll see that in the next chapter as well. Yeah? It seems like okay, we have the, here's the productive capital, here's the financial capital, depending on the circulation time, you know, those. Uh, this sort of, but missing from this are commodity capital, right? Where you have stocks, inventory, and things like that, which I guess maybe where it was handled a little bit earlier, but it seems like that's been sort of abstracted out of this analysis here. Or yeah. perhaps, you know, times of the working uh, period and, uh, yeah. and circulation time could also, then you're looking at inventory stocks, like, you know, we're talking about just in time, all this, right. all this sort of thing. Sort of been abstracted here, and yeah. all we're looking at is yeah, yeah. Right. This is characteristic of volume two to abstract from all those things. I mean, obviously, if at this point the merchant capitalist comes in and says, all right, I'll discount your bill of exchange, or I'll discount, I'll just take your commodity capital off your hand, when merchant capital comes in here and says, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do this bit for you, then you don't have to lay out your extra 300 pounds. The merchant capitalist does that for you. So as soon as merchant capital intervenes, so again, the chapter on merchant's capital in volume three enters in at this point and says, well, you know, the producer capitalist is only interested in this, and as soon as he gets to this point, wants to sort of get rid of the commodity and the commodity capital, then and there, and then the merchant is bothering, is bothering with that and doing what they can. So, but, but in order to get that, in order to, um, you don't get the full 900, you get 900 minus whatever's discounted that you're going to pass over to the merchant capitalist. And let's suppose that's the 300, so the 300 goes there. But again, Marx's argument in merchant capital is that the merchant capitalist is, is, is efficiency and both is efficient, and, and they will get part of that 300, and, and, and they won't have to give up the whole 300. They'll give up, you know, maybe 200, and, and, and they'll, you know, so that, that's, a, so yeah, it's, it's abstracting, it's abstracting. I mean, the whole analysis is, very, is, is based on very abstract and, 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 and you know, and constant capital purchases. At some point, he kind of says, well, you can stagger them too on a just in time thing. You don't have to have them all at the same time. So it's a very, very, very highly simplified. Thing and, uh, and and I think you know again once you once once you're familiar with the, what the merchant capitalist does and what the credit capitalist does you can see well you know a lot of this disappears when they get into the act but you can understand you can understand where where why they might get into the act and how they might get into the act which is why I did like this one statement where he kind of says this is the foundation of a credit system all right in the next section the next chapter. So the variable circulating capital. Now, 900 pounds is given here to the laborers. So 900 pounds is going to labor over the course of the week. And they're getting 100 pounds a week. Uh, and, and, so, and they're getting on a weekly basis. So they're, they're, getting, they're getting their 900 pounds this way. Uh, in this direction, of course, we've, we've got the production of a surplus. So 900 pounds is simply variable capital, so there's a circulation process of variable capital. 
you, then, then you've got the 900 pounds and you can start again and, uh, employing labor, okay? And again, you're going to produce uh, a, a surplus. So what Marx then looks at and wants to look at here is this circulation process uh, of, of, of labor. And, and uh, it gets a little frustrating because he concentrates on bits of it that uh, don't excite me as much and the really interesting stuff is all deal, dealt with in the sort of capsule kind of commentaries at the end. So the variable circulating capital, he says on 369, expended in the course of production can serve again in the circulation process only to the extent that the product in which its value is reproduced is sold, transformed from commodity capital into money capital so that it can be laid out anew in payment for labor power. So we've got to deal with the circulation side of it. So on 370, he says, for the question that we have to deal with now, we must go one step further and treat the variable part of the circulating capital as if it alone formed the circulating capital. In other words, we shall disregard here the constant circulating capital that turns over together with the variable capital. So again, you eliminate that. So, he gives the example on page 371. If a variable capital of 500 pounds produces 500 pounds, then 5,000 produces a surplus value of, wonderfully, 10 times 500, which is 5,000. His mathematics is correct for once. The variable capital advanced, however, is 500 pounds. And this then introduces a new category. The ratio of the total surplus value annually produced to the value of the variable capital advance we call the annual rate of surplus value. In the present case, this is 5,000 over 500, which is 1,000%. Okay, that's case one. And so, top of 372, he says, the variable capital of 500 pounds, which turns over 10 times in the year, producing an annual surplus value of 5,000 pounds, its annual rate of surplus value, thus being 1,000%, we shall call capital A. Let us now suppose that another variable capital, B, of 5,000 pounds, is advanced for a whole year, here for 50 weeks. I guess everybody has two weeks holiday in Marx's calculations. In any one week, the variable capital of 100 pounds that is applied produces a surplus value of 100 pounds, which is exactly the same as, as capital A. So in 50 weeks, the capital of 50 times 100 produces 5,000, produces a surplus value of 5,000. Here the surplus value produced during the year divided by the variable capital advanced is 100%, whereas for capital A, it was 1,000%. So the annual rate of surplus value is going to look very different depending upon the number of turnovers there are in a year. 500 pounds turning over 10 times can produce the same mass of surplus value as 5,000 uh, pounds, which is turned over only once. And when you calculate the rate of surplus value, not on a sort of a daily basis or a weekly basis or, a, or whatever, you see that there's radically different surplus values. Now, this obviously uh, bothers Marx because at the bottom of 372 he says, this phenomenon makes it appear as if the rate of surplus value did not depend only on the amount of variable capital and the rate of exploitation of the labor power set in motion by it, but also on inexplicable influences deriving from the circulation process. And in fact, the phenomenon has been interpreted in this way, if not in this pure form, then at least in its more complicated and concealed form, that of the annual rate of profit. Since the beginning of the 1820s, this phenomenon has led to the complete destruction of the Ricardian school. Well, the problem here is that, that actually, if you look at this, it looks as if surplus value is originating out of the circulation process. Right? Because the rate of surplus value is, is, is so much higher uh, in, in the case of rapid turnover than it is in long turnover. Now this is, it goes against Marx's theory of value, right? And obviously Marx is very concerned that people seeing this would immediately say, see, so it's circulation, the, 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 the circulatory conditions actually produce the value. And, and, and Marx is obviously kind of, uh, you know, uh, not going to have any of that. So what he has to do is to show that actually this is not, this is not the case, and he has to do it both to defend his own theory of value and also to attack the Ricardian school. Okay, so this is where we get into 
well, you said this and I, I said that kind of, kind of stuff. Um, so he says, well, this, uh, in, his, in his view, led the Ricardian school into all kinds of things, and, and, and the footnote kind of says, Theories of Surplus Value, Part 3, Chapter 20, and I went and take, took a look at that, it's a very, very long chapter. But the interesting thing was, I couldn't see anything in there, at least uh, at a quick sum, of, of, about turnover time as being, being significant. Um, certainly Marx is, is thoroughly critiquing the, the, the Ricardi all the Ricardians in, in this chapter, and, and, and I th think the chapter is called The Destruction of the Ricardian School, you know, but it doesn't, it, it occurs for all kinds of other reasons other than the ones that he's going to uh, explicate here. This strangeness immediately disappears if we really do place capitals A and B in exactly the same conditions, and do not just appear to do so. Um, and then he, towards the bottom of the page, he says, it is only the capital actually operating in the labour process which creates surplus value, and to which all the laws given for surplus value apply, including the law that, with a given rate of surplus value, the mass of surplus value is given by the relative magnitude of the variable capital. And this then leads him on 374 to make, again, a very important uh, distinction says, OK, let us now return to our original examples. In both cases, A and B, equal variable capitals, £100 per week, are applied each week of the year. The variable capitals that are applied and actually function in the labour process are therefore the same. But the variable, variable capitals advanced are quite unequal. Big distinction being made here between variable capital applied and variable capital, capital advanced. Uh, and he's kind of going to say, uh, at the bottom of 374, he explicates this more directly, the variable capital advanced functions as variable capital only to the extent that it is actually applied, and during the time for which it is applied, not during the time in which it remains advanced in reserve without being applied. But all circumstances that differentiate the ratio between advanced and applied variable capital can be summed up in the difference in turnover periods, determined by a difference either in working periods or in circulation periods, or both. And then he quotes the law of surplus value production, and he says, uh, you know, during specific uh, periods of time, they must produce equal amounts of both A and B must produce equal amounts of surplus value in this time, no matter how different may be the ratio between the variable capital applied in the time in question and the variable capital advanced during the same time. The variation of this ratio, instead of con contradicting the laws put forward for the production of surplus value, rather confirms these and is an inescapable consequence of them. So he's reconciled, if you like, the fact that there is indeed a major distinction in the rate of surp annual rate of surplus value between, w which is affected by uh, this, uh, uh, affected by turnover time, but that you can actually simply uh, reduce it back to something that is entirely predictable given how Marx sets out the law of surplus value. The difficulty, of course, is why not? Why? Why? If if the turnover time is one year, do you have to have the five thousand pounds advanced at the beginning of the year? Uh, why can't you start off with you know the same as capital A and then borrow money? You know, and do it do it in pieces. Why do you have to have it all there? Marx is assuming you've got to have it all there at the start, so that at the end of the first five weeks you end up with a you started with a five thousand pounds and you end up with four thousand five hundred after the end of the first five weeks, because, you know, 500 is gone, as happened with the others. It's only that you haven't got your commodity on, on the market. Um, and this, after some sort of rather tedious argumentation, takes, if you jump to, to 380, he says, let us call uh, the annual rate of surplus value S prime. Uh, the real rate of surplus value is little s prime, i.e. what happens on a daily or a weekly basis. The variable capital advance V and the number of turnovers N, and then he does one of his little kind of da da da, da ends up with the obvious thing that the annual rate of surplus value is always S times N, i.e., the rate of surplus value multiplied by the number of turnovers. 
So this is how he is generally re reconciling the two arguments, which is not a very sort of complicated uh, kind of argument. And then uh, 381, he says, the annual rate of surplus value, or the comparison between the surplus value produced during the year and the total variable capital advanced, as distinct from the variable capital turned over during the year, is therefore not something merely subjective, but a comparison produced by the actual movement of capital itself. Again, what Marx is doing here is kind of trying to say, well, this has a logical basis, this distinction, and it has an objective basis, and I can show what it is, and here I've shown uh, what it is, and he's obviously very happy with himself that he's, he's managed to do this, uh, to, to reconcile uh, the, these differences in annual surplus value. And right towards the end then, on 383, he says, however, by turning over ten times, and hence repeating its advance ten times, the capital of five hundred pounds performs the function of a capital ten times as great, a capital of five thousand pounds, just as five hundred shilling pieces that turn over ten times in the year perform the same function as five thousand turning over only once. Now this is a, an interesting comparison, because what he's doing here is um, comparing the velocity of money. If you remember that, where well, velocity of money is the number of times in a given week that a dollar bill changes hands, it's the velocity. And, and obviously uh, you, you increase, you know, you need a certain number of dollar bills to do all the exchange. If you increase the, the velocity, you don't need as many dollar bills. And he's saying this is an analogous situation uh, to that, the velocity of money is, is analogous to what happens here. Now, this, however, um, is where I had very much wished that he had spent a little time talking about the significance of all of this for his own theorizing. In Volume 3 of Capital, Marx tends to ignore the whole kind of question of turnover. Uh, he apparently had a, uh, an empty notebook with a title, uh, which was the effect of turnover on the profit rate, but it was an empty notebook. So what Engels did was to write a chapter in Volume 3 about the effect of turnover time on profit rates. And what Engels says there is just a sort of, which I think comes back to your, your kind of point, that uh, he says there that the profit rates of two similar capitals vary inversely as their turnover times, and that the direct effect of the abbreviated turnover time on the production of surplus value, and therefore also on profit, consists in the increased effectiveness which this gives to the variable portion of capital. Now that, of course, is what Marx is, 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 is talking about here. But there are some very far-reaching implications for Marx's own argument. As you, as you know, M Marx in Volume 3 uh, argued very strongly for the idea there is a law or a tendency for the rate of profit to fall. But what we see here is the fact that the the the, there's a big kind of question, how is the profit rate calculated? Is the profit rate for the capitalist uh, the ratio between surplus value earned in a year and capital advanced, or is it capital applied? And I think the answer is, for the capitalist, it's, it's, it's capital advanced. You know, It's what you have to advance in order to gain your profit. And clearly, if that is the case, and then the profit rate is calculated in terms of surplus value in relationship to uh, capital applied versus or capital advanced, then you get rather different kinds of measures. But I don't see how you could realistically expect the capitalists to do it on the basis of capital applied, they're going to do it on the basis of capital advanced. So if we take that, then you would see that this ratio between surplus value produced in, on an annual basis and capital advanced is highly sensitive uh, to turnover times. And it's sensitive in two direct dimensions and one 
a third indirect dimension. First, this reduction, uh, reduction of circulation time relative to working period, right, immediately has an impact uh, on capital advanced. In other words, you needed, you needed this, you needed a total of 1,200 to get you to here, capital advanced. If you cut this back, then you only need uh, 1,100. If you cut it back to there, you only need 900. So reductions in circulation period immediately raise the profit rate. Okay. Other things being equal, you know, which they never are, but you know, it, but the argument would have to be that a reduction of the ratio between circula circulation time and working time raises the rate of profit. The second way in which the, the profit rate can be raised is a simple reduction in turnover time, full stop, which could be working period and circulation time, some combination of the both. Now, last time we talked about the tendency to re reduce working period, right, with the kind of Chinese building a hotel in, in 90 hours, you know. So a, re a reduction of turnover uh, of, of, of working period and circulation time constant, or you can just say reduction of circulation time and, and, and working period reduces it. So any reduction in aggregate turnover time actually raises the profit rate. So in these two dimensions you have the possibility of raising the rate of profit. Now we've already uh, argued a little bit, or thought a little bit, about what it is that reduces circulation time. Well, it's revolutions in transport and communications. Now Engels in his chapter talked dramatically about what he called the revolution in transport and communications in terms of their impacts upon on circulation time. The coming of the railroads and the coming uh, and, and steamship dramatically reduced circulation times. Now, it, it's very interesting, the, there's some calculations I think which have been laid out which we will look at. We, we tend to think that things are speeding up right now, but back in the 19th century the increases were phenomenal. For example, uh, just in terms of the spread of information, some calculations that kind of say the coming of the telegraph versus the post, you know, sending letters, increased the efficiency, if you like, of communications by 2,500 times. It was a huge increase. So the telegraph system versus you know, postal service did that. If you took the contemporary situation and said, how far has the internet improved over, say, the fax? It's only five times. In other words, the revolution that we think we've been going through, and it's all very dramatic in terms of reduction of space and time, is nowhere close to what went on in the 19th century. Nowhere close. Nowhere close. And living through that, by the way, was really traumatic. I mean, there's a book I always like, you know, the sign people, which is called Shivelbush, called The Railway Journey. So here's, if you like, I think one of the big uh, issues uh, of, of, of a real, which is going to have a tremendous impact on rates of profit. Tremendous impact, particularly during those years. Less so now. I mean, that's the point I'm trying to make: is that actually, you know, what happens with circulation times in particular, and what happens to turnover periods? I mean, there's more em effort, I think, these days on working period than on circulation times. I think in the 19th century it was mainly circulation times. Working periods in production of housing didn't get revolutionized very much. They are the ones that are getting revolutionized now. Working periods are being reduced. But that's the second, if you like, of these direct forces. Now the indirect way, which is actually not so indirect, is of course through the credit system and through merchant capital, um, which uh, obviates the necessity to advance capital for the whole period. Uh, and, and, uh, but again, there's a price which is attached to that. But you, again, you go, going back to the argument of the former chapter, if this is all a necessary basis for the credit system, uh, then this has, I think, a big impact. Um, 
Now, this is a, uh, like I say, uh, a rather important idea to try to insert into Marx's more general theoretical uh, argument. And the turnover time material in volume three, uh, like I said, is inserted by Engels. Uh, there's very little uh, made of the impact on turnover time on profit rates in uh, uh, the chapters on the falling rate of profit. And it was seen to me that this would then have to be in incorporated as one of the counteracting forces towards a tendency to a rate of profit to fall. And given what I was commenting about uh, a little bit earlier, uh, the revolutions in transport and communications obviously have a tremendous impact upon this. And then, in a way, uh, this is also a tremendous impact that the credit system and the, right and the existence of merchant capital also has on it. Now, the degree to which uh, that's going to actually uh, offset the tendency towards falling rate of profit, I think, is a moot point. I mean, I have no idea. It depends very much on the conjunctural circumstances and how that's worked out. But I think this is, um, there's some very important uh, ideas here that need to be taken account of when you're, when you're reading uh, volume, volume 3. Now, if we continue with this uh, chapter, there are some, there are some immediate um, issues uh, which is raised shortly after on page 384. Um, which is a rather rather tentative, but, uh, and it was going to come back uh, big time towards the end. And that is about, all right, what, what are the workers doing? I mean, we mentioned that workers are being paid on a weekly basis, say, and they get their 900 pounds uh, over these nine weeks. And at the same time, they're spending that 900 pounds on, on uh, consumer goods in order to live. And, and uh, so Marx, at this point, uh, gets to uh, recognizing something which is going to become important, more important in the, next, in the coming chapters, which is the question of working class consumption. As he says at the top of 385, this 500 pounds, originally part of the total capital advance, has ceased to be capital. Now, this is important. It has been paid out in wages. The workers, for their part, pay it out again in purchasing their means of subsistence and consume means of subsistence to the value of 500 pounds. A mass of commodities amounting altogether to this value is thereby annihilated. That is, that it's consumed, it's disappeared. And what the worker may save as money, etc., is also not capital. This mass of con commodities is consumed unproductively as far as the worker is concerned, except in, so mu in as much as he thereby maintains his labour power, which is an indispensable instrument for the capitalist in working condition. Now this notion of unproductive, we've come across this several times. And it's a rather, you know, intuitively it's a rather uh, a kind of awkward or, or, you know, inappropriate way to think about workers consumption as being somehow unproductive. But you see Marx's point, as we mentioned in the stuff about fictitious capital, to the degree that the worker is not actually producing surplus value when they're eating and sleeping. It's unproductive as far as the capitalist is concerned. So your, your definition of productive is about, is it producing surplus value? And if it's not producing surplus value, then it's not productive. That's in Marx's definition. You know, and, uh, and again, Marx tends to be uh, representing always the, the, the capitalist perspective uh, that they don't, you know, to them it's, it's, it, it's, waste of, it's wasted time, the fact that the worker's at home sleeping and all this kind of thing, the only good thing about it is the worker comes back the next day and is refreshed enough to be able to go back into the workplace. So the workers are, are consumers uh, and the wage is in a particular kind of relationship. I mean, we've mentioned, you know, capital is always working on this MCM circuit, but the workers are working on the uh, are operating in this MCMC circuit. That they get the consumer goods, they have labour power as a commodity to sell. They get the money and they then use it uh, to buy the consumer goods. So they are in this kind of circulation process, uh, which is, I think, uh, completely different uh, from the MCM circuit, which is the which is the, the capitalist circuit. 
Now, the stuff on the turnover of uh, variable capital um, sort of begins to morph into the sorts of some serious uh, general, general questions. And these are taken up, at least as I see it, on, on 388 uh, in the section on the turnover of variable capital considered from the social point of view. He says at the bottom there, the shorter the turnover period of capital, and hence the shorter the intervals at which its reproduction period is repeated in the course of the year, the sooner is the variable part of the capital originally advanced by the capitalist in the money form transformed into the money form of the value product created by the worker as a replacement for this variable capital. The shorter too is the time for which the capitalist has to advance money from his own funds, and the smaller the total capital that he advances in relation to the given scale of production. The relatively greater therefore is the mass of surplus value that the capitalist extracts in the course of the year. This is the case of you know, capital A back in the beginning. And then a little bit further down, the preceding investigation has led us to the result that According to the varying, mag varying magnitudes of the turnover period, money capitals of very different scale have to be advanced in order to set in motion the same volume of productive circulating capital and the same amount of labour given the same level of exploitation of labour. When, however, you get to case B, uh, he takes it up at the bottom of the page, that since the money with which the workers employed by capital B pay for their means of subsistence and withdraw them from the market, is not the money form of their own value product cast into the market in the course of the year, as is the case with workers employed by capital A, it follows that although they supply the seller of their means of subsistence with money, they do not supply any commodity, either means of production or means of subsistence which he could buy with the money provided, which is the position, however, with A. Hence labour power, means of subsistence for this labour power, fixed capital in the forms of the means of labour applied under capital B, and production materials are all withdrawn from the market, and an equivalent in money is cast into the market to replace them with. But no product is cast into the market during the year in question to replace the material elements of productive capital withdrawn from it. So you see an imbalance. You know, capital is paying out over the year, 100 pounds a week or something like that for the whole year. The workers are going into the market and demanding a, a product, but as, as far as the market is concerned, no product is coming from them. So this is again an imbalance. I mean, if you imagine a one a capitalist economy, uh, the workers would not have any, anything to spend their money on. And they would all starve because there was not. I mean, we're assuming, of course, that somebody out there is producing things that they can consume. But the the point here is that these are imbalances that arise because of the tuna, uh, turnover stuff. Uh, and and these imbalances create all sorts of uh, uh, potentialities for disruption, which then leads Marx into a rather astonishing kind of statement of the 390. If we were to consider a communist society in place of a capitalist one, then money capital would immediately be done away with, and so too the disguises that transactions acquire through it. The matter would be simply reduced to the fact that the society must reckon in advance how much labour, means of production and means of subsistence it can spend without dislocation on branches of industry which, like the building of railways for instance, supply neither means of production nor means of subsistence, nor any kind of useful effect for a long period, a year or more though they certainly do withdraw labour, means of production and means of subsistence from the total annual product." This is sort of, uh, you know, kind of saying, well, you'd need something like, uh, you know, Soviet-style five-year plans, uh, you need to sort of work this, this, this all out. Um, and Marx obviously has the idea that the, there would be a way in which you could calculate all of these requirements and you wouldn't need uh, these fluctuating money markets and all the rest of it uh, to, to, to operate. And he then goes on to say, in capitalist society on the other hand, where any kind of social rationality asserts itself only post-festum, after the feast, as it says, major disturbances can and must occur constantly. On the one hand there is pressure on the money market, while conversely the absence of this pressure itself calls into being a mass of such undertakings and therefore the precise circumstances that later provoke a pressure on the money market. And then in the next section he says, the other side of the coin is pressure on society's available productive capital. 
since elements of productive capital are constantly being withdrawn from the market, and all that is put into the market is an equivalent in money, the effective demand rises without this in itself providing any element of supply. Hence prices rise both for the means of subsistence and for the material elements of production. During this time too there are regular business swindles and great transfers of capital, a band of speculators, contractors, engineers, lawyers, etc. enrich themselves. These exert a strong consumer demand on the market and wages rise as well. As far as foodstuffs are concerned, agriculture is given a boost by this process, but since these foodstuffs cannot be suddenly increased within the year, imports grow as well as the import of exotic foods, coffee, sugar, wine, etc., and objects of luxury. Hence oversupply and speculation in this part of the import trade. So what Marx is doing here is kind of suggesting that the, the, these business cycles and these speculative binges and so on have a lot to do with the way in which these uh, throwing money into the market with no, with no production and then withdrawing money from the market uh, oh, precipitously, all of those things going on, you're likely to find uh, some of the um, you know, speculative efflorescence that you get in a, in a typical capitalist society. He goes on right at the bottom, 390 onwards. On the other hand, in those branches of industry in which production will be increased more quickly, the price rise leads to sudden expansion, soon followed by collapse. The same effect occurs on the labour market, drawing great numbers of the latent relative surplus population and even workers already employed into the new lines of business. Undertakings of this kind, such as railways, generally withdraw from the labour market on a large scale a certain quantity of force, which can derive only from branches such as agriculture, etc., where only strong lads are needed. This still occurs even after the new undertakings have already become an established branch of industry and the migrant working class needed for them has already been formed, e.g. when railway construction is temporarily pursued on a scale greater than the average. A part of the reserve army of workers whose pressure keeps wages down is absorbed, wages generally rise, even in the formerly well-employed sections of the labour market. This lasts until, with the inevitable crash, the reserve army of workers is again released and wages are pressed down once more to their minimum and below it. And then comes uh, the footnote, which is, uh, you know, I think deserves a great deal more consideration in Marx's general theory, contradiction in the capitalist mode of production. The workers are important for the market as buyers of commodities. But as sellers of their commodity, labour power, capitalist society has the tendency to restrict them to their minimum price. Further contradiction, the periods in which capitalist production exerts all its forces regularly show themselves to be periods of overproduction, because the limit to the application of the productive powers is not simply the production of value but also its realisation. However, the sale of commodities, the realisation of commodity capital and thus of surplus value as well is restricted not by the consumer needs of society in general, but by the consumer needs of a society in which the great majority are always poor and must always remain poor. This, however, belongs rather to the next part. Well, we don't get the next part, you know, and this is where I wish he'd spent far more time actually elaborating on this kind of part of the argument rather than doing all those crazy numbers about, you know, the turnover time is five weeks and then it's three weeks and, you know, blah, 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 blah. So, but, but Marx is, is clearly recognising here that there's, a, there's, there's some unfinished business he needs to take care of, uh, which is not only the, the fluctuations, if you like, which he starts off with here of kind of, well, there's too much and then it gets withdrawn and, and, and so we expect these kind of uh, speculative moves and people being brought into work and then thrown out of work and, 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 and consumption to pick up and then wages to pick up and then get crashed, do those kinds of things. Not only that, but there is, if you like, a deeper kind of almost uh, uh, permanent uh, problem, permanent uh, deeper contradiction, which is how do you how do you sell your products uh, when the mass of the population is kept in an impoverished state? How do you how do you do that? And and this is again something that is going to crop up in in the in the next chapter. But here is, 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 I think, just sort of uh, quickly kind of uh, mentioned. But again, what we find is that some of these questions become entangled 
uh, about, you know, when it gets to sort of where is the market and all this kind of stuff, get entangled uh, with this other theme that keeps on sort of coming back of bits and pieces of, of this, which is the, what's the relationship to distant markets? So on 392 at the top he starts to talk about the length of the circulation period. This is partly conditioned, he says, by the constant change in market conditions, the greater or lesser ease of selling and the necessity which arises from this of casting the product partly on nearer and partly on more distant markets. Apart from the scale of demand in general, the movement of prices plays a major role here. Sales are deliberately restricted when prices are falling, while production goes ahead. And the converse occurs when prices are rising, when production and sale keep in step, or selling even takes place in advance. However, the actual distance of the place of production from the market outlet should be considered as a specific material basis. And then, right at the end, 393, he starts talking about the export trade to India and, and, and what gets unsold and how uh, the, the, the market and the money market work in geographical perspective. So, these social kind of questions which are being raised here about the circulation of variable capital and the demand for goods uh, that uh, the labour labour classes exert, and and what that has to do with the wage rate and how many of them are employed and how many are unemployed, all those kinds of questions, seem to me to be uh, rather rather more significant than. I mean, Marx is saying they're significant, no question about it, but he just doesn't give us a very good analysis of it here, and we'll get some of it in subsequent chapters, but uh, unfortunately I think uh, nowhere near uh, enough. Well, that's all I really want to say about this turn of a variable capital. Do you have, does anyone have any kind of comments on it yourself? I mean, there are issues that you see in here that I haven't seen, because, you know, like I say, I struggle with this stuff, you know, and try to figure out what, what's going on. And, and what is the significant argument and what is not. Yeah. I find these passages always very important when he gives a little glimpse of what, how he imagines a communist society. Yeah. He does it in Capital One in the, in the midst of, or at the end of the fetishism chapter, when he talks about the um, free world of the free producers, and, and here as well. And um, I, I admire, in a way, the realistic way he is approaching that. Uh, in a way he says every society has a problem to regulate where to invest the labor force even for a long period uh, where they're not producing anything and how to compensate that and his assumption is but that can be done in a more rational and right. uh, way and not that it hits you from behind yeah no I mean the, the, the communist society he's talking about is is open to rational calculation and uh, you know you can find ways of rationally calculating this and actually I think it's a little bit unfair to capital sometimes because I think the capital does engage in rational, you know, internally within corporations they do indeed engage in rational calculation of this kind. The big problem is that it's not actually then taken socially and that's one of the big kind of questions. Yeah. Or oh, the further comment on that, uh, I think that it's a little bit other way. We, we discussed the rise of the managerial class. Yeah. I think that in many ways Marx, just, uh, in, in, a, in a few areas, uh, you know, he says uh, he does have a faith that, that that managerial class can be, you know, released from the constraints of capital and that, you know, we can, that, that once, we, yeah, once released from the, from, the, from the necessity of turning a profit, then we can just use that managerial class to. Which then, uh, goes to his idea, which maybe from our perspective right now looks a bit crazy, that the joint stock company is a transitional form of organisation in which so associated capital could be turned into a world in which associated labour. Uh, but a uh, joint stock company certainly does do rational calculation of, of, of this kind, and, and I think that, you know, he sees yeah, you can you can put this the managerial side and the, and the joint stock company form and the communist society. I mean, you can start to construct a little bit of a, a shadowy notion of what his idea of communism is from 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 these passages. Whether it's an effective thing and, and, you, and you know, it's another question. But at least you get you can get some ideas to what he has in mind. Yeah, somebody here. Yeah. Do you think that in addition to holding credit constant in this in this chapter, Marx is also holding educational workers constant? and not mentioning it maybe at some points because, I mean, assuming that they're building a locomotive over nine weeks, right? There's, 
you can't really like hire and fire people within four week if they don't assume right. skills in the process um, that that are contributing to them finishing up the product. Yeah, well, again, it tends to abstract from you know both potential disruptions in the workplace, but also kind of all those kinds of questions. Labor is really being treated here in a rather sort of homogeneous kind of way. And again, it comes back to the nature of the assumptions he's using and what I think he's really driving at, which is, you know, I mean, and of course, the, the notion that you're in an economy where only variable capital circulates and there's no constant capital is crazy, you know, but, but you can see why he, he makes that as the abstraction. So. Um, I don't know. Do people find the level of abstraction very troubling? I mean, Marx is full of you know, levels of abstraction, which are kind of <laughs> way up there. But on the other hand, what's interesting is how you can start with the power of abstraction. As he says, you know, as a scientist, I don't have the ability to engage in controlled experiments. So I have to use the power of abstraction all of the time to, to, to try to uncover what some of the basic relations are. But I think uh, this is one of the difficulties. I, I often find myself having to repeat, so I may as well repeat it here, which is that the statements which occur at any part of capital, volume one, volume two, volume three, are always contingent on all of those aspects that are held constant and are being abstracted from. So when he says, this must happen, it's this must happen if all of these conditions uh, obtained. People love to criticize Marx and they take one of these statements and kind of say, oh, he predicted so and so and so and so. Well, obviously it didn't happen, but actually when you go and look at what he was doing at the time, he'd abstracted from so many things, but obviously it wasn't going to happen, but what you see from the abstraction is that there is a problem here which otherwise doesn't get identified. And it seems to me, you know, Marx's genius in lots of ways is to, is to be able to do that and to point to some of these kind of questions. And through those questions, I think, enlighten us as to what kinds of processes uh, are we surrounded by? I mean, and why certain things happen? I mean, uh, when I first kind of read this uh, many years ago, I, I was kind of so struck by, by things like the whole acceleration of turnover times that's gone on in the history of capitalism. And where does that come from? And people kind of, you know, the tendency elsewhere is to, is to treat it as natural. Well, well, we're human beings, of course we want to do that. Of course we want to speed up. And I'm thinking, we do? Uh, you know, lying in bed, I say, do? We do? Yeah, okay. And, and you kind of go, uh, but, but here, you see, here you see very clear, I mean, why I think is, is so, so great about this, even though it's, a, it's a, uh, in many respects a do total mess, is when you see what I think is clearly articulated here, which is the impact on the rate of profit of shrinking circulation times and shrinking working periods. And you kind of go, well, capitalists are after maximizing their rate of profit, so the whole history of capital is going to be about that. And it is. So, so we see why. And we see why we're living in a world where that's going on, and, and we, don't, we, we, we no longer naturalize it as if somehow or other this is this is what human beings are always about, you know. You kind of go, and, and, and of course, you know, when, when colonial administrators found people who weren't thinking like that, they got mad as hell and considered them unnatural uh, because they didn't want to speed up, you know. And they kind of said, you know, the people here are recalcitrant, they're, they're, they're uncivilized. And you kind of go, what's civilized about the way we live, where it's all about speeding up and, you know, going crazy all the time and getting neurotic about, you know, can I be this place at this time, you know. So I think what's, what's good about it is, is, is precisely through these levels of abstraction, as you can see, certain principles which are, which are deeply embedded in a capitalist mode of production. And we live those principles every, on a daily basis. And, and, and we understand why. And, and then if we don't like, uh, you know, the way we have to live on a daily basis, then we can say, well, one of the, one of the ways, the only way we're going to get out of this is, you know, join an anti-capitalist movement and, you know, have done with capital. And I think that's where this kind of, well, if you're in a communist society, it wouldn't operate this way. But presumably you wouldn't also be really concerned to accelerate turnover times in the way that, 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 that we are. So I think, you know, those are the, those are the things that are, that are 
I think, uh, the really interesting things that come out of it. The, the sp specific mode of argumentation, as you see in these chapters, is often very tedious. And, and, and uh, yeah, Marx is obviously having arguments with, other, with shadowy figures in political economy a lot of the time. And, and uh, you know, that, I, I find that less interesting than the macro argument about, you know, where did this come from and how, how has it we got to have to live this way. The circulation of surplus value. This, is, uh, uh, this to me is an extremely frustrating ch chapter because there are a lot of things I think that I, I, you know, I think this is, this, is the, this is one that's really going to tell me all kinds of things I want to know. But it doesn't. It, uh, it, 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 uh, but anyway, let's deal with it then. Uh, he starts off by saying, we have already seen how the variation in turnover period produces a variation in the annual rate of surplus value, even the mass of surplus value only produced remaining the same. And he then goes back to capitals A and capitals B and the fact that one has to advance. It. And he then immediately gets into well, the capital advance, does it have to take care of repair and maintenance of fixed capital? And you kind of go, well, that's a big issue, I'm sure. Um, and he can basically says, well, in the case of capital A, you basically are turning it over enough that the repair question doesn't come up. You can then capitalize surplus value, can take care of it down the way. If you're circulating capital on a year, you may have to advance some capital to take care of repairs. And I mean, well, OK. The same thing happens, again, with uh, fixed capital. But again, um, we get, you know, on 395, uh, once the development of credit intervenes, the relation between the capital originally advanced and the capitalized surplus value becomes still more intricate. And, and then he gives the case, well, people can start to borrow money to start up. Uh, and the expansion of the scale of production, he says, at the bottom of the, the page can proceed in relatively small doses. In certain circumstances, alternatively, when the working day is not restricted by law, you can actually do it uh, yet another way. Alternatively, again, he says the capitalized surplus value, given favorable market conjunctions, may permit speculation in raw materials, operations for which the capital originally advanced would have been insufficient, and so on. Then there's the kind of question of uh, how do you, uh, you know, how do you expand on the next page? He says, on the other hand, extension of the whole business on a proportional scale, partly by expanding the entire plant, the buildings, for example, partly by increasing the labor fund, is possible only within certain limits, which may be broader or narrower, and requires a volume of additional capital. In other words, you just can't incrementally, you know, add a dollar here, a dollar there. You've got it's just a so lumpy business. Uh, you need lumpy. If you want to build a new factory, you've got to build a new factory. You've got to have enough money to build the whole factory. Uh, but then, of course, he comes back and says, well, there occurs with this, with the development of capitalist production, however, in the middle, there occurs a simultaneous development of the credit system and the money market. Uh, and, and a lot of this is taken care of through the money and the cre money market and the credit system. And he starts to sort of talk a little bit uh, about that. He then has, uh, uh, 397, he has these, uh, this long quote from uh, uh, William Thompson who's a rather intriguing character, and I kind of like what he has to say. He's a conventional economist, but at least he saw the world in what I think is kind of quite interesting sort of terms. And uh, he, he kind of says, uh, you know, look, uh, people tend to pay attention to the wrong thing. The mass of real accumulated wealth is so utterly insignificant when compared with the powers of production. And, you know, legislators and political economists should be, do, be concerned with productive powers and their future free development, and not as hitherto to the mere accumulated wealth that strikes the eye. And this is a guy who's got this productivist kind of thing. Marx, obviously, I think, would approve of that. Um, and I, I think some of, you know, what, what people think and, and what people should be really paying attention to, and he's very, very uh, sort of much about the significance of, of labor and, and its productivity and, and who they are and what they are. Um, and and, uh, and uh, the, the language is great. I mean, on 399, he says, the annually produced and consumed masses, like the eternal and incalculable waves of a mighty river, roll on and on and are lost in the forgotten ocean of consumption. 
you know, how much have we lost in the forgotten, you know, in, 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 you know, forgotten in the ocean of consumption? On this eternal consumption, however, are dependent not only for almost all gratifications, but even for existence, the whole human race. And then he goes on and sort of is highly critical of uh, the, the dynamics of distribution. And he says, uh, one of my favourite quotes from Thompson is this, this one, in comparison to the preservation of this actual distribution, which is the distribution of wealth uh, for the capitalist class, the ever-recurring misery or happiness of the whole human race has been considered as unworthy of regard. That's about the Republican Party right now. To perpetuate the results of, fraud, of force, fraud and chance has been called security. And to su the support of this spurious security have all the productive powers of the human race been unrelentingly sacrificed. I think this is a brilliant kind of you know, conceptualization of our own era, and somebody writing in the 1820s, you know, who was not Marx, you know, could see this very clearly at that time, and that has actually been the recurring problem of capitalism. This is what capitalism does. It, it, it imagines security comes from the accumulation of wealth, and you sacrifice everything and include, uh, you know that the perpetuation of force, fraud and chance, uh, well, this, is, this is called security, and this is a spurious security. And, uh, you know, so I, he's kind of interesting kind of, kind of guy. So then Marx does, well, all right, the circulation of surplus value, and two conditions, simple reproduction and then expanded reproduction. How does it work? Now, there's a recurrent theme in here, which is the question keeps on coming back. And 404, he kind of says, the question is not where does surplus co value come from, but rather where does the money come from which it is turned into? And again on the next page, but before the commodity capital is transformed back into productive capital of surplus value contained and it is spent, it must be turned into money. Where does the money for this come from? And then it says this seems difficult. Now, this then gets him into a lot of discussion in here on the role of the money producers, i.e. the gold producers. And, uh, you know, obviously they have some role in this, uh, that they actually are, are making money by mining gold, and they're therefore contributing more money than they're taking out, because they're, they're actually making money. I mean, they're, make, they're making the money form, the gold commodity. So they obviously have a, a, a role in it, but, you know, and I understand why Marx is very, very concerned uh, to, to talk about it, given the, the gold standard of the time and all, all the rest of it, so, but on the other hand, I don't think this is the real issue, and I don't think Marx is actually saying that this is the answer to the question. In the end, the money supply in itself is not actually going to answer the question, where does the money come from? And part of the reason for that is that, that if you need more money to circulate commodities and you haven't got enough gold around, you simply create bills of exchange and all the rest of it. And you, again, the credit system comes in, and, or you accelerate the turnover time of, of money, the velocity of money or something of that kind. There are many ways in which money can accommodate to, you know, so it's not a, it's not a physical problem that there's not enough notes around or not enough gold around, and even if there is not enough gold around, there are other ways to actually accommodate the circulation. So it's not and an issue of the money supply per se. And, and uh, so from the standpoint of uh, the money supply, he says on sort of 407, from the standpoint of money supply, the problem itself, he says, does not exist. However, there does exist from the standpoint of capitalist production the semblance of a special problem. For here it is the capitalist, the man who casts the money into circulation, who appears as the point of departure. Now, in effect, what we're arguing here is that where is the effective demand going to come from at the end of this production process? So we, we've got a, a production process, and what Marx is, is suggesting is the following, that you, you start off with, with 900 pounds, uh, say, and, and at the end of the day you've paid labour 900, so this 900 comes back in, and that is a, a demand for goods. 
all right? Now, at the end of here, you've also, so this is the variable capital, which is going to be recycled back into to the next phase. OK, so we, we've got to this point. This is the 900 pounds of, of variable capital, which then, then goes back in and goes back out here to labor again, and you keep on going. So the 900 pounds just keeps on going. This is a simple reproduction. The big question is, what about the 900 pounds or 900 dollars of, sur of surplus value? Who's going to buy that? All right. Where does the money come from? Well, you know, Marx's argument is that actually the point here is that the capitalist has to live. During these nine months or whatever. And the capitalist has to live, and the capitalist has to consume. So the capitalist, in effect, has to consume $900 worth of goods during these nine months. And the capitalist buys back the surplus value from their consumption. Right? That's the argument. Right. Now, the, the assumption, of course, uh, is that the capitalist actually consumes that amount. Uh, and he says on 408, he says, the capitalist class remains the sole starting point of the money circulation. If it needs 400 pounds for payment for means of production and 100 pounds for payment of labor power, then it casts 500 pounds into circulation. But the surplus value contained in the product, given a rate of surplus value of 100%, makes up a value of 100 pounds. How can the capitalist class continue to extract 600 pounds from circulation if it only ever puts 500 pounds in? Out of nothing, nothing comes. The entire capitalist class cannot extract anything from the circulation sphere that was not put into it already. And then he goes on to say, 409, in point of fact, paradoxical as it may seem at first glance, the capitalist class itself casts into circulation the money that serves toward the realization of the surplus value contained in its commodities. But note well, it does not cast this in as money advanced and therefore not as capital. It spends it as means of purchase for its individual consumption. Thus the money is not advanced by the capitalist class, even though this class is a starting point of its circulation. And then it goes on to say, a little bit further down, he does not advance this money as capital, he spends it, i.e. pays it out for an equivalent in means of subsistence which he then consumes. This value is spent by him in money, cast into circulation and withdrawn from it in commodity values. These commodity values are consumed by them. them. Thus he has ceased to stand in any relationship to their value. That is, this is not capital, ad capital advanced, this is money spent. And it has to be spent, of course, in such a way, as he says, middle of 410, it was assumed in this case that the sum of money that the capitalist casts into circulation to cover his individual consumption until the first reflux of his capital is exactly equal to the surplus value that he produces, and hence has to convert into money. This is obviously an arbitrary assumption in relationship to the individual capitalist, but it must be correct for the capitalist class as a whole, on the assumption of simple reproduction. It simply expresses the same thing as this assumption implies, namely that the entire surplus value is unproductively consumed, but no more than this, i.e. no fraction of the original capital stock. So it is the capitalist, it's capitalist consumption that does it. So the capitalist has to spend not only advance 900 pounds here, but they need 900 pounds, well, dollars, we convert, put it all in dollars. So. <laughs> it's easy. Nine hundred dollars. They need nine hundred to advance nine hundred dollars, but they also leave nine hundred dollars to live on. So the capitalists and their hangers-on have to actually cast nine hundred dollars into circulation during this working period, and then that picks up the surplus value here. Now, the next time around, what do they do? By then, this consumption, which they've spent, is converted into the surplus value that the laborers have produced. All right? So now they no longer consume something that they've taken from themselves, 
They simply will consume what it is that the labourers have produced. Now, several times in capital we've come across this idea that even if the capitalist starts off with some money of their own, within a very short period they've essentially consumed that away and are living off the surplus value produced by the, by, by the labourers, i.e. those who are produ producing the value by mixing their labour with the land are being appropriated uh, by the capitalists. So at this point, as soon as it gets to the next round, then they put 900 into here, because that's come back in this form, they, they take the 900 here and they put 900 back in and so they live on surplus value forevermore. And Marx says, as you recall from Volume 1 of Capital, and it, again it was, it was said earlier here, you, you can't, you can't uh, say that this really belongs to the capitalist after a while, it really should belong to the labourer because they're producing the surplus value, they're the ones who are working and they're the ones who are producing value. The capitalist enters in here as a consumer and as a, as a, as a capitalist advancing money and then, and then lives off uh, forevermore uh, the joys of, 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 this, um, uh, of the surplus value which others have created. So this is the argument that, that is being made in this chapter, but He's then kind of saying, well, but actually this doesn't work so well, it, this works fine if the turnover time is, is, say, five weeks. But what happens when the turnover time is two years? Or one year? Then this doesn't work well at all. Uh, you know, I mean, the poor capitalist may starve before actually you get any return. So at that, at that point, again, the credit system comes into the, the game. In other words, in other words this, this simple kind of system that the effective demand, in, in, in a sense Marx is saying the effective demand has two forms, one is the effective demand of the workers, which is coming here, and the effective demand of the capitalists, which is coming here. And you put the two effective demands together and you get aggregate effective demand. But in a situation where, uh, you know, uh, the production period the, is, is, is like this, uh, then the capitalist is going to have to keep pumping stuff in at this rate right the way through for years and years before this, this comes to fruition. And they can't obviously, you're not really in a position to do it. When, when the turnover time is, is very short, you can, you can do it. So if you, 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 you buy a sewing machine and you, you set up a sweatshop and, and you have people make shirts and the shirts can be made on a three-week schedule or something like that, then then okay, you could do it this way, but you can't do it in aggregate. So capital B, Marx says, doesn't work this way. Uh, there we need something uh, different. Uh, and uh, which then gets him into um, some kind of uh, obvious problems of, of, of inputs and outputs. As he says on 4.13, what this does is, uh, again, we're going to see fluctuations in the economy depending upon turnover time. In considering the turnover, we've already seen that the circumstances otherwise remaining the same. Changes in the length of the turnover periods make different amounts of capital necessary in order to continue production on the same scale. The monetary circulation must thus be elastic enough to adapt to this alternate expansion and contraction. And there can be situations, a little bit further down, he says, if we consider, for instance, the case of a general rise in wages, a consequent general fall in the rate of surplus value, there would not be, again, on the assumptions made here, any change in the value of the mass of commodities in circulation. And he then talks again on the way in which uh, demand for workers and rising wages uh, can increase uh, demand for luxury items on the next page, and he talks about the way that uh, workers can buy luxury goods, uh, and, and then again we get this notion of temporary oscillations. After a few oscillations the mass of commodities in circulation is the same in value as before. As for these temporary os oscillations, moreover, they can have no other result than to cast into domestic circulation as unoccupied money capital, capital which formerly sought employment in speculative undertakings on the stock exchange or abroad. And then he has an interesting little passage. The reply to the second conception is this, if, there, if it were within the capacity of the capitalist producers to increase the prices of their commodities at will, 
then they could and would do so even without any rise in wages. Nor would wages rise with a fall in commodity prices. The capitalist class would never oppose trade unions, since they would always and in all circumstances be able to do what they now do exceptionally under certain particular and so to speak local conditions, i.e. use any increase in wages to raise commodity prices to a far higher degree and thus tuck away a great to profit. Guess what happened in this country between 1945 and 1970s? That's exactly what happened. Unions were tolerated, wages could rise, because capitalists could use that as excuse to raise prices and make an extra profit. Now, what that led into, of course, was inflation. And gradually the uh, inflation got greater and greater until you had the inflation crisis of the 1970s. But for 20 years, actually, this was tolerated. And it was tolerated largely under condition of monopoly control and monopoly capital. That is, monopoly capital can do this kind of thing, because monopoly capital can raise prices. Nobody's going to do it. And, and you know, the Detroit at that time was essentially, there was no competition with, with the big three. The big three engaged in what is called kind of price leadership and following games. That is, there was no active collusion. They just sort of simply saw, you know, Ford raised its prices and so GM raised its prices. And, and then they, they kept on raising prices. And, and they gave concessions to workers, and they tolerated trade unions, and they didn't want to smash the unions, and they're perfectly happy. And in fact, this era of the 1945-70 was uh, the, the era of very strong growth in the United States. It also happens to be an era, uh, very interestingly, when the, the top tax rate started at 92 percent and never fell below 70 percent. So anybody who tells you that high tax rates you know, destroy prospects for growth, just say, well, what about 1945 to you know, 19, late 1960s? Uh, you had the best growth, consistent, persistent growth performance in the U.S. economy that's ever been. Workers were much better off, those that were employed. I mean, the problem was it was badly distributed within the working class, and you had racially excluded minorities and, you know, all the rest of it. But, and, were, and trade unions were tolerated. And, and there was a, you know, uh, there was games played between corporations and they, you know, they do all these things. So, but it was kind of interesting, Marx kind of said they can only do this exceptionally, but in, it was, but in, in, in terms of U.S. history, the, this was an exceptional period for all sorts of reasons. And, and, and uh, it, it's kind of very interesting that Marx has a description of, of how that can work in, in exceptional circumstances. Section 2 on accumulation and expanded reproduction says, well, what happens uh, when we start looking at this as an expanding system? And again, Marx typically spends a lot more time talking about you know, simple reproduction than he ever does about expanded reproduction, and we're going to find that in the segments that, that, that come. And he starts off this by saying, as far as the additional money capital is concerned, that required for the function of the increased productive capital, this is supplied by the portion of realized surplus value that is cast into circulation by the capitalist as money capital, instead of as the money form of revenue. In other words, uh, instead of the capitalist spending all the whole 900 on, on consumption, they have to maybe dedicate half, half of it to the expansion of the system. So you get a division of the 900, uh, 450 is, is going as revenues, i.e capitalist consumption, and, and the other 450 is going to, uh, is going to expanded, expanding reproduction. Now, we've already argued that actually the expansion is going to be lumpy and jumpy, right? Because, you know, like I say, a factory, you need to you know, have enough money. So again, uh, the credit system becomes absolutely crucial. Uh, to much of this, and then he kind of says, well, where does, where does this uh, expansion come from? And again, the credit system comes in uh, on, on 420 and then goes out, because we assume on 421 that the credit system does not exist. But then in 422, he uh, uh, comes back to how he sees it. He says, but difficulties start to arise when we assume not partial accumulation of money capital, but general accumulation within the capitalist class. 
Outside this class and our assumption, that of the universal and exclusive domination of capitalist production, there is no other class except the working class. The total purchases of the working class are equal to the sum of their wages. This money flows back to the latter through the sale of their product to the working class, that, that flows back to the capitalist class. Their variable capital therefore thereby receives its money form. So he's really talking about this circulation process of CMC that I mentioned <coughs> earlier. Apart from the case, he says towards the bottom, in which all, this all-round monetary accumulation simply expresses the division in whatever proportions between the various individual capitalists of the additional precious metal which has been brought in, how else is the entire capitalist class to accumulate money? They would all have to have sold a part of their product without buying again. It is nothing mysterious that they all possess a certain money fund which they cast into the circulation sphere as means of circulation for their consumption, and of which each receives a certain part back again from the circulation sphere. But this monetary fund is then precisely a circulation fund, acquired by the conversion into money of surplus value, and does not consist at all of latent money capital. So the question is, where does the latent money capital come from? And he says, well, it exists in three forms. Bank deposits, Okay, government papers, that is, uh, you know, treasury debt and all the rest of it, but simply, you know, or shares. And he kind of says, in all these cases there is no storage of money, and what appears on the one hand as a storage of money capital appears on the other hand as a continuous real expenditure of money. There's no storage of money capital there because these are all claims on future production. And so, in a way, future production, claims on future production becomes the basis for reinvestment. And this becomes, I think, a very, a very important idea uh, that actually uh, the effective demand uh, where consumption is now productive consumption instead of individual consumption, that effective demand in that situation can only be sustained through the creation of claims on future product. You know, so the future actually is discounted into the present, which of course is what an interest rate already does anyway. So these future claims become very, very significant for the stabilization of, of, of current realization of surplus value. Because if the, if, the, if the capitalists are no longer consuming 900, all 900, they're only going to consume 450 and, and, and use 450 in some way, then this 450 is, going in, is, is a claim on future output. Right? This 450 is a claim on, the, on, on the, what's going to come back here. And if the capitalist does not, can't live and needs 900 to live on, how else are they going to get that 450? Well, they're going to have to go to the bank or they're going to have to go somewhere else, which is issuing claims on future, future output. So this, if you like, becomes the secret of this. So this is very tangentially sort of presented, and I have to say I don't find it very satisfactory, but it is. Uh, but it's, I think a very Im Im important idea that the capitalists are the initial source of the consumption, particularly in simple reproduction. When you get an expanded reproduction, the, the, you get into these complicated kind of questions of claims on future output and claims on future production, which is, I think, a very uh, important, very general result, uh, which you know is, is, is significant, I think, for the way in which we interpret Marx's general argument, and we'll get back to that uh, other time. But I want you to get through, uh, that we're coming to part uh, uh, three, which is very, very significant. And I'd like you to get uh, a little bit into chapter 20, uh, which is a very, very long chapter. Uh, and, and I'd like you, to, like you to get to page 487. That is the first four sections of chapter 20. Um, the former presentations of the subject, not so interesting in lots of ways, uh, but read lightly through that, but take great care in reading. Uh, maybe you can go a little bit further. Um, I would, yeah, why don't, why don't we? Uh, go a little bit, a little bit further into the simple reproduction stuff uh, to 497, okay? 
I'm going to spend most of the time talking about the, what's called the reproduction schemas. These are very important, and, and uh, most people, I think, would regard this part of Volume 2 as being Marx's most creative contribution to economic theory in general. And, and so uh, we need to take, we take a couple of weeks on, on this stuff. But again, reproduction is, simple reproduction is dealt with a great length, expanded reproduction, uh, not at all. Okay, so we'll see you in, in two weeks. Thank you.